let's start with a clear operating kind of definition of of hypnosis. Sure. You know, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word hypnosis, what would come to mind straight away is perhaps witchcraft or a scene from a movie or uh, perhaps they were watching a, a magic show or, or a magician. And so they think of that stage hypnosis. How is the hypnosis that you're researching and you're using with patients different to what people may have seen on, t- on TV? Yeah, that's one of the banes of my existence, uh, Simon, is that's exactly what people think about. They've seen, you know, these stage shows where, you know, the football coach dances like a ballerina and, you know, everybody laughs. Um, I don't like that. I don't like making fun of people. But I would say to say that that's really what hypnosis is, is like saying that people that were out there selling snake oil are what modern pharmacology is, you know, and, and there is some truth to it. And I would say the image that might help us sort of grasp where, you know, the gold buried in all the dirt is, um, is uh, if a football coach can dance like a ballerina in front of a bunch of people who are going to laugh at him, it indicates a capacity to change, to try being different and see what it feels like. Now, that was not a pleasant thing. It's not a good thing to do, but it does show that hypnosis can get people into a state where they can actually change, where they can be different. And what hypnosis is, is a combination of three things. Intensely focused attention, like looking through the telephoto lens of a camera, which you see, you see with great detail, but you're less aware of the context. Um, it's, do you ever get so caught up in a good movie that you forget you're watching a movie and enter the imagined world? more hypnotizable people are more likely to do that. So it's focused attention. Now, the way you do that is you put outside of conscious awareness things that would ordinarily be in consciousness. So right now, your body has sensations in your your bottom and your back touching these wonderful, elegant chairs that you have here. But hopefully you weren't even aware of that until I mentioned it. If you were, we can just stop now, you know. So so were you aware of those sensations? No, but as soon as you say it, your you awareness are, goes right. there. So you drop into that place. Exactly. And so our brain is all the time in the service of concentrating, deciding what to attend to and what to ignore. So there's all kinds of signals around us that in order to do something in a linear, sensible way, you've got to put outside of awareness other things. In hypnosis, you do more of that. You dissociate things that would ordinarily be in consciousness. And that's why people can dissociate pain, can control pain. It's why soldiers in combat who have been badly wounded may rush to help somebody else and not even notice how badly wounded they are. Uh, It's what we've noticed in people in this tragedy in the Middle East now, where people are badly hurt and they're rushing around trying to help somebody else. So especially at times of stress, um, you can extremely dissociate things that would ordinarily be in consciousness. That's a hypnotic-like state. The third part of it is this suggestibility part. You know, can you make anybody do anything? No, you can't. All hypnosis is really self-hypnosis. And so, but you may at certain times when you're absorbed in dissociating, um, put aside your normal presumption of who you are and what you're like. And we know what's going on in the brain when that happens now. Um, and so you try out being different. And that's a great therapeutic opportunity. So it isn't really suggestibility, it's cognitive flexibility. And that's what people do. So that allows you to potentially have a perspective shift. Right. On on whatever it is, whether it's pain, whether it's some type of habit that you're wanting to break or an addiction. Exactly. That's exactly right. I I can give you an example. Um, When people, you know, a lot of the treatments for people who need to stop smoking, uh, which everybody needs to do, um, uh, involve dealing with the urge. I have the urge to smoke. I'm hooked on nicotine and all that. And you know what? The urge isn't the issue. What we say to people is go into a state of self-hypnosis, get your body floating safe and comfortable, and tell yourself three things. One, for my body, smoking's a poison. Number two, I need my body to live. And number three, I owe my body respect and protection. I asked them to think, would you ever put tar and nicotine smoke in the lungs of your baby or your pet cat? No. So why would you do it to your own body, which depends on you? So you focus on what you're for. So it enables people to take a different point of view and and just stop. I had one uh, woman with Reverie, actually, uh, our, our uh, self-hypnosis app, 
who said, I smoked for 25 years. I didn't even particularly want to stop smoking. I kind of liked it. Um, and uh, But I saw you were doing a study, so I went and tried it. And I didn't like it the first time I tried it. But I went home that night. I thought through those three points. For my body, smoking is a poison. I need my body to live. I owe my body respect and protection. I looked at the lit cigarette in my hand and said, Feh, who needs this? I put it out. I haven't touched a cigarette since. My friends can't believe it. And I'm going around helping them. And she said, you know, this is some kind of crazy ass voodoo shit. And I mean that in a good way. So that was uh, rather spontaneous or that took a number of hypnosis sessions? It was, it was she, she did it. It was using self-hypnosis from the app. And she did it several times. Uh, but once she had made that conversion, she didn't need to do it anymore. Hey friends, the scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12-week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. There's a lot of overlap with what you just said. We were speaking off air about uh, Dr. Judson Brewer. Yes. And in the episode that I did with him, he was really emphasizing this point of awareness being firstly very critical to breaking a, a habit, some type of destructive habit that you're trying to reduce or get rid of. And most importantly, changing the reward value, which is what you just spoke to. So really getting very honest with what you think about that behavior and how it's affecting you. Yes, uh, and uh, that was a great interview with uh, Judson Brewer. He's a terrific guy. He does wonderful research on on mindfulness. Um, he he gets you to observe the urge without feeling you have to do anything about it. It's what in mindfulness they call open presence. You just let the thing flow through you. You don't feel you have to act on it. You just observe it. What we're doing is a little different. It's very much related to it. You're right, but we're putting the focus more on what putting tar and nicotine into your lungs does to your body. And so the urge may be there, it may not be, it could even be very strong. So what? Would you poison your baby because of an urge like that? No, well, your body's as dependent on you as your baby. So we're a little more focused and focusing slightly on something different. You're right, we're both dealing with the urge, but in slightly different ways. Right, but in, in doing that, what you're speaking to there, the way that I'm kind of comprehending that is you're getting that person to a point where the scale tips such that when they think about that behavior, it's a net negative rather yes. than being a net positive and something that can kind of uh, appease that that craving that they have. Right, right. I mean, there are very similar. Uh, they're both effective approaches to helping people stop smoking. We get one out of five people to stop, and the remainder cut down on the amount of uh, smoking they do. Um, but um, he's focusing on don't be driven by your urges. Now, we do that too, but in a different way. So he's just saying any urge, you know, good, bad, indifferent, it's just an urge. You don't have to act on it. And that's valuable. That's useful. We're saying however strong the urge is, focus on what carrying out that urge would do to your body. Are you willing to do that to your body? So you're focusing on what you're for, respecting and protecting your body. And where there is this positive reinforcement that you feel that Judson talked about and that, that we're talking about too, um, is the minute you make that decision, you can feel good about yourself. You don't feel I'm depriving myself of something. You feel like 
I'm taking a stance that will respect and protect my body. I'm going to be a better parent to my own body. Yes. Yeah, it's it's additive to yeah. your life. Right. You're adding to your Rather life. Rather than, You're not taking, than, exactly. than I'm, I'm missing out exactly. on something. Exactly. Taking something away. Right. So, Coming back to the distinction between stage hypnosis and then clinical hypnosis. So I mentioned to Jose, one of our camera guys here, a wizard. He, <laughs> he said to me, I'm terrified of hypnosis. Sorry, Jose. <laughs> I'm not sure if you wanted everyone knowing that. But that seems the to camera be- camera's shaking now. I mean. That seems to be a, quite a, a common response. And I think yeah. that is- from this idea that hypnosis gets you into a position where you lose control and yes. you're being controlled by someone else and that could perhaps put you into a vulnerable position. But what you're saying is that clinical hypnosis, you're still in control, there's just a perspective shift? Yes, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. Um, I don't do anything to people, I show them how to manage their own hypnotic ability. And so, you know, we're social creatures, Simon, and, and you and I know that people believe a whole lot of things that are just flat out not true. Uh, and that can happen without hypnosis. You know, we are susceptible of social influence. That is true. But in hypnosis, you can intensify your focus on the content. It's like the way when you get lost in a movie, you know, while you're in it, you're not thinking, oh, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why would he do that? You know, you just you're just flowing along with it. Hypnosis, you're, allow, you're allowing yourself to focus your attention. And what we found doing psychological testing of highly hypnotizable people is they're good at set shifting. They're good at changing their perspective on something, not clinging to an old point of view. And that is a, a basis for change. And so it, it is true that you're probably more willing to try something new and different and it could be a bad thing, but it could also be a good thing. And it's not that you're, you know, turning your brain and your body over to somebody. It's that you're allowing yourself to reflect on being different and see what it feels like. Um, and anytime we take advice from people, we take direction from people, we buy an investment somebody suggests, we're responding to somebody else's influence on us. And we are free to do it or not to do it. In hypnosis, you're more likely to give it a try. And highly hypnotizable people tend to do that more. That's fine. So it's an opportunity for change. It's not turning yourself over to somebody else's control. I had to laugh. I put out a, a kind of question box on Instagram uh, saying, I've got this episode coming up on hypnosis. What would you like to hear us talk about? And someone commented, I don't eat red meat. And so someone commented, can you be hypnotized to eat red meat. <laughs> and <laughs> and I thought to myself, to <laughs> I thought to myself, I think that already happened earlier in my life when I was eating like 500 grams of red meat a day. Yes. Well, you know, look, if you're worried about undue influence, think advertising, right? You know, um, and, uh, you know, the, the companies that make hamburgers, you know, spend a whole lot of money making them look good and tasty and trying to lure you into eating them. Um, and, and so there are lots of ways to influence people. And, you know, hypnosis could be one if somebody wanted to do it. But the problem is social influence. It's not hypnosis. Hypnosis.